together rather than curly braces and semicolons. But this uh, article series, Mastering Mean, the very next article that you're going to see published, hopefully still this month, but realistically early next month uh, in May, will be on testing the mean stack. So you're getting an early sneak preview um, as to what the rest of the world will get a chance to read about in just a little bit. So when we install MeanJS, one of the things you probably noticed in package JSON, and let's see here, there it is. One of the things you probably noticed in package JSON were all of the runtime dependencies. All the things that your application needs in order to run. So we have Express, the web server. We've got uh, Mongoose in there. Um, Passport to handle our logins. All kinds of good things like that. This talk, we're going to spend our time focusing on dev dependencies or our developer dependencies. And one of the dev dependencies you'll see in there is Grunt, which is our build script. We'll have a chance to look in there in Grunt quite a bit. But in addition to Grunt and all the Grunt plugins you see here, you will also notice Karma and several Karma plugins as well. And so even though we're talking about testing the mean stack, and as we'll get to in just a moment, Karma is a pluggable testing framework, you aren't going to be able to talk to a mean developer too long without having them bring up Karma. So Karma is our start. It is our test runner. It is our test framework. And what's interesting about Karma is it was written by the Angular team. I didn't get a chance to mention this uh, in the previous talk. We didn't spend a whole lot of time talking about front end uh, particulars, Angular in particular. But one of the reasons why I love AngularJS so much is that it was written by testers. Angular is hands down one of the most testable web frameworks you have out there right now. Angular has first class support for things like dependency injection. Now those are things you take for granted on the Java platform, but in JavaScript it's very new. But what do you get with dependency injection? You get mock objects. All of a sudden now when you're running your tests, you can begin injecting in a fake HTTP client rather than a real HTTP client. So you'll use your real HTTP client to make those real RESTful web services calls in your real production app. But for testing, we'll be able to inject in a fake HTTP module that will abstract us away from the real network connections. And if you were in my keynote this morning, remember the fastest thing you can do is do work on the CPU. And the slowest thing you can do is actually put packets on the wire and wait for a response. So with the mean stack, not only do we have a wonderful 21st century production platform, it shouldn't surprise anyone that we have a wonderful 21st century testing infrastructure as well. And that is what KarmaJS brings. So they say right there on the KarmaJS team, we rely on testing and always seek better tools. And so like all good open source developers, they had an itch to scratch. And thus Karma was born. So what is Karma? Well, one of the things they wanted to make sure we could do is run real tests on real devices. And so over and over again, you're going to see Karma popping up real browsers like Chrome and IE and Safari. It also has the ability to do tests on mobile devices, on tablets, on smart TVs. So really what we end up with here are a set of tests that we're able to run on all of our target platforms. That's 
Cool, that's worth the price of admission right there. Yes, it's open source. Yes, it can be remotely controlled so you can plug something like this into your continuous integration server. If you're a Java shop, you're probably using Hudson or Jenkins or Cruise Control. If you're a Node.js developer, you might be using something called Strider. Strider CI that allows you to do continuous integration, but Karma snaps in perfectly well. And once we talk about Phantom JS, which is that headless web kit that we can run on our continuous integration server, you can see we've got a nice, rich, robust testing platform. But I've been saying this very, very carefully this entire time that Karma is a testing platform, not a testing framework. Because another real power of Karma is it really doesn't much care what test library you use. And what you'll find is that when we're running server-side tests, we'll end up running them in Mocha.js, which is a really nice server-side testing framework. And the client-side tests will be written in Jasmine, which is a really nice client-side testing framework. But Karma allows you to plug in whatever testing framework you'd like. So if you're not using Karma, you're, excuse me, you're not using Jasmine and you're not using uh, Mocha and Chai, you could be using QUnit. You could be using... Uh, JS unit. You could be using uh, any number of TDD or BDD libraries because Karma will handle all of them equally well. So just to be clear, Karma isn't a testing framework, but what it is is a test environment for whatever tests you have to be written running on whatever devices you happen to be targeting. Does that help? Does that make sense? Yeah? Outstanding. So we've talked a little bit about Node already. Karma requires Node. And it's interesting because you don't even have to be running Node in production. Many times I have my developers, when I come in on a new project, install Node, even though they're Grails developers, even though they're Java developers. Because Node as a JavaScript platform is required for you to run Grunt. Node as a platform is required for you to run Yeoman. And Node as a platform is required for you to run Mocha and Jasmine and Karma itself. So you need to be sure that you're comfortable with Node. We talked about Yeoman being able to install Yeoman. So this is all review and I'm skipping past it because you already know it all. But here we go. Part of what we get with that same MeanJS stack that we discussed earlier is that you get Carmen, excuse me, Karma and Jasmine for your client side tests. And if you want to install tests and use Yeoman to really explore this, you would say something like, yo, MeanJS, Angular test, and be able to scaffold out a client side test in Jasmine. Similarly, if you wanted to run a server side test, you would say, yo, MeanJS, express test, and it would lay out a sample test for you using Mocha. JS. So the same tool that we used in the previous session to install the app, to scaffold it out, to give us new CRUD modules, we can use here as well to build out new tests. I would really like to be able to live demo this. Let's see if I can do an npm install and get the rest of this installed. And if not, we always have plan B, right? Waiting, waiting, waiting. All right, like all good things, we'll come back to that and see what kind of progress we've made in the interim. All right. So in order to get started with the MeanJS app, we would type in yo MeanJS and have our app in place. Now, I've taken you into package JSON a couple of different times, but let me show you once again exactly what we're dealing with. 
All right, still waiting. So I said that part of what we're dealing with in our dev dependencies right here is Grunt and a number of different Grunt plugins. Now, Grunt is our build script. There's another popular JavaScript uh, build framework out there called Gulp. Are any of you playing around with Gulp at all? Yeah, a couple of you. Do you like it? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, it's interesting. Grunt is kind of the established uh, build scripting tool out there. Gulp promises to be lighter and easier to use, but we've got to see if the community um, embraces it or not. But one of the things you'll notice out of our uh, Grunt um, uh, build file is you'll see it's got plugins to uh, JS Hint and CSS Lint to minify and uglify all kinds of things. But we will see Grunt karma in there as well. And so this is the linkage between our build script and our testing environment. You'll also see a number of plugins in here like Grunt Mocha to run our server-side Mocha tests, um, Grunt Protractor to run our user acceptance tests, and even something like Istanbul to give us uh, code coverage on our JavaScript. But all of these have to do with our build scripts. What you'll find when it comes to Karma is it's not so much a build script but a testing framework. So a lot of the things you'll see in your dev dependencies for Karma end up bringing in support for different devices or browsers. So when we're bringing in Karma in here, you'll see support for Jasmine in Karma. You'll see a Karma JUnit reporter. You'll also see a number of different launchers to launch various browsers. No, no live demos for you today. That's OK. That's all right. If <laughs> I did have a working mean app in place, we could type in grunt test, and what you would see happen is exactly what comes up on your screen. Let me zoom in on it a little bit so you can see what it's doing kind of step by step. All right, well, the first thing is it does is it starts running our Mocha tests. And so we can see our tests are all passing right there, and wonderful, we have gotten six passing Mocha tests. Now, Mocha were our server-side tests. Later on, you're going to see Karma unit coming down in here, and Karma is starting things like a PhantomJS browser. PhantomJS is our headless web kit, so this is all of our Jasmine tests running as well. So being able to type in Karma, excuse me, grunt test, is very powerful. Let me see how far we get. These are, these are a lot more tests than we need. But let me turn around and use Grunt to fire up my web server. There you go. We're looking good here. And then over here, let me type in Grunt test. And what we'll see this time are a number of tests running, running, running. There we go, and I feel good done without errors. That's always nice, isn't it? Yeah? So what we have here is a command that we typed in. We typed in grunt test. Now we're getting close. There we go. And you see interesting things like, all right, well, grunt test is going to run karma. And karma is looking in a file called karma.conf.js. So let's catch up with the slide deck right here. And we will walk through these particular files. So there's this grunt file 
that we were talking about. One of the things that the mean stack supports is this idea of named environments or named configurations. And if you're a Rails developer or a Grails developer, you're very familiar with this. We can set a node environment variable to develop, and it will have its own set of database connections and behaviors that you want, maybe more verbose stack traces. And in production, you'd have a different set of database configurations. But in test, you'll have another set of settings. So in this grunt file, being able to uh, deal with the test environment is very nice. Inside that test environment, one of the things you'll see here is the ability to separate out your Mocha tests, that's in the app test directory, and your client side tests, which once again are down here in this Karma comp file. So when we go looking at this Karma comp file, we see a number of interesting things in there as well. One of the things it'll tell us is what testing frameworks do you want to use? We said that Karma was a pluggable test framework, so this is allowing us to use Jasmine. It's asking for a list of files that we want to test that's built out there. It asks us for a series of reporters. All of these things are things that we're going to tweak throughout this presentation. But out of the box, it'll run a series of Jasmine tests using simple dot 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 progress reporters across the screen. And where is it going to run those Jasmine tests? Well, it's going to run them on PhantomJS. So when I come over here once again and type in grunt test, you're going to see that it's going to actually execute these tests. We see that it's starting the Phantom JS browser. And since it's headless, we can't see anything, but we have dots letting us know each one of those tests pass and then eventually comes back and says done without errors. So Phantom is one of those things that if you're doing MeanJS development, you're almost certainly going to want to have Phantom installed. It's just kind of there. You don't have to. We can always disable it. But so many of our tests we run in a headless browser because we don't have to worry about our computer wasting CPU cycles to upgrade a screen, to push pixels around, to do those kinds of things. We can run it headless and know that it's running in a WebKit browser. We just can't see it. One very interesting hook in PhantomJS is if you have failing tests, it will render the failing web pages as an SVG page or as a PDF. So even if you are running this headless and Jenkins says, hey, these tests failed, if you've configured it correctly, Phantom will have screenshots of those failing tests waiting for you as well. I can't recommend PhantomJS highly enough for your testing needs. It does a really wonderful job. So we're back here in package JSON. And we're in package JSON because we need to know what browsers we can support. So looking back at this package JSON, anything with a launcher at the end of it, Chrome launcher, Firefox launcher, Phantom JS launcher, Safari launcher, should give you a pretty good idea of what browsers we can bring to the party. So if I come into my karma.js file, my karma comp.js, and instead of testing in phantom, if I decided that now nah, what I would prefer to do is come down here and test in Chrome. I've just made one change here. But what is that going to look like when I run my tests? Oh, you know what? Chrome was in a different window here. Let's do this. Let me shut this down. 
come back and run it once again because what I want is I want you to see Chrome pop up and run and run and run. And of course it's not popping up, it's still popping under. That is the type of day I'm having, yeah? But we do see that it was running those tests in Chrome, not Phantom. Let me see once again if I can catch you. Where are you at, Chrome? There we go. It was popping under right there. But you can see that Chrome popped up long enough to run our tests and then shut back down again. But this Chrome, uh, this Karma Comp file is a comma delimited list. So what happens if I decided to run it in both Chrome and Safari? Now all of a sudden we're going to see all those same tests running in two different browsers, Safari and Chrome, and then shutting down altogether. So you begin seeing that this is a real additive effect that I can start building up a list of as many browsers that I would like in here, and I'd be running the same set of tests across all those real devices. So it's the combination of making sure that you have launchers installed and then using those launchers in your Karma Conf.js file is what brings these two pieces together. Does that make sense? It's remarkably easy. So now, how do we end up getting these browsers if they haven't been installed? Well, we use our good friend NPM. If you know the name of the package you're looking for, you can say NPM install Karma Chrome launcher double dash save dev and it will save it. But if you don't know what you're searching for, being able to do this little bit of magic, not NPM install, but NPM search, and NPM search for Karma, but then filter it, grep it on only Karma modules that have the keyword launcher inside of them. And this is the very definition of insanity, right? Continuing to go back to the internet connection that I know is not working. But, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, all right. All right, that's fine. You can see here if you did that, you would end up seeing Chrome and Firefox and IE and iOS and Opera and Phantom and Safari and Slimer JS, so all kinds of good things like that. And that's obviously a partial list right here. But there are a number of different Karma launches out there, literally dozens and dozens of them for all the major platforms that you would be looking for. So let's say that we were on OS X and we wanted to install the Safari launcher if it wasn't already there. You know, you're expecting something like this to show up, Karma Safari Launcher, in your dev dependencies down there. So they say the easiest way to do this is to do an npm install Karma Safari Launcher, double dash save dev. So once you have the launcher in place, you can turn around then and add Safari to your list of browsers, or you can do it from the command line as well, a karma start double dash browsers, and then giving it a list of your browsers to do there as well. So if you wanted to drive it from the command line, you could. Since we end up doing continuous integration, we really favor putting in a comp file and shoving that up on our server. But once you added Safari to the bunch, so now we have PhantomJS and Chrome and Firefox and Safari, we would be able to run the same set of tests and we would see Safari added to the mix. We begin seeing a pattern forming here? Yeah? Well, I told you we mentioned Slimer. If PhantomJS is WebKit, 
and WebKit is what drives desktop Safari and mobile Safari and Kindles and Blackberries and Samsung TVs and PS4s and all number of things. There are a number of other WebKits out there. Gecko is one that runs Firefox and Firefox OS and a number of things like that. If you can pluck WebKit out of a browser and run it headless, you ought to be able to pluck Gecko out of Firefox and run it headless as well. Once you're turned on to this, once you know what's going on, this headless JavaScript engine, headless render kit is a really powerful model. How many of you are Java developers? Yeah. Did you know that you have SpiderMonkey installed with every JVM since 1.6? SpiderMonkey is Firefox's JavaScript engine. And it shipped standard with the JDK starting with 1.6. Now, SpiderMonkey was written in C and C++, so what they did was they took that C code, ported it to Java, changed the name from SpiderMonkey to Rhino, and shipped that standard with 1.6. So if you're running JDK 1.6, you have Rhino, which is essentially Firefox's JavaScript runtime running headless on the JVM. Slimer is Gecko, which is Firefox's render kit running headless for testing purposes. So yeah, so once we have Slimer, well, we can begin adding Slimer to the mix, installing our Slimer launcher, adding Slimer JS to our list of browsers, and then all of a sudden our headless continuous integration server can be running all of our tests in a Firefox compatible web kit, uh, Firefox, excuse me, compatible uh, render kit and a Safari compatible render kit. You can feel fairly confident that you've got uh, a pretty good test coverage going on there. Yeah? So this is a pattern we'll be able to repeat over and over and over again. Like um, an iOS launcher, if you wanted to run these tests in a simulator, and that's what the iOS launcher is for, is for the iOS simulator, well, you know the pattern at this point, right? You'd be able to go in there. Now there is a problem with the iOS launcher. First of all, it only launches a simulator. Not the real thing, and the other problem is it's currently broken. But other than that, it works perfectly well, yeah? Yeah? It's only broken, and I say currently broken because typically what happens is Apple will rev Xcode, and then the launcher will break, and so they have to upgrade the launcher, and then this will break, and that, you, know, you get the idea, right? But the idea is we want to be testing on real devices anyway. So rather than using that launcher, Another very powerful concept is the ability to capture your browsers. Now the way I have Karma configured right now is I have it configured to run a test once and exit. Single run is true. Now if I say single run false, what you'll see happen here is I'll run my tests and Karma will run and stay running. So now it's hanging out and I could point any browser I wanted to to that running instance of Karma. If Karma can't launch your browser, then your other option is to leave Karma up and running and have your browsers attach to that running Karma instance. And this is something we used to great effect at uh, Time Warner Cable when we were testing smart TVs because there was no chance that the test running on our continuous integration server is going to go out and hit the on button of a Samsung smart TV and launch our app and manage it that way, right? And so if we can't have Karma drive that, what we can do is leave the Karma server up and running and have browsers attached to it.
So once you do all this kind of good stuff and set single run defaults, then what you could do is visit the web server's IP address and the port it's running on. So the port I'm running on right now is the default one 9876. Fairly easy to remember, right? So what that means now is I could come in, let's see here. So both Safari and Chrome are up and running. Let's bring up Firefox just for grins. And then let me connect here to localhost 9876. And all of a sudden now we can see that Firefox, even though it's not listed in the Karma JS, is running and all those tests got done running on that as well. So being able to turn around and connect to a live running Karma instance is a very powerful way of accomplishing that. And realistically, this is what we end up doing when we end up doing our testing in IE. Because we're not running our continuous integration server on a Windows box. We're not running any of our developers on Windows boxes as well. So what we have is a testing lab off in the corner that has a dedicated Karma server that's always up and running and a dedicated Windows box that has simply been captured. And every time we push new tests to the Karma server, it actually pushes those new tests to all the connected browsers and runs them. The way it does this under the covers is really actually very interesting. It uses WebSockets under the covers. And if you know anything about WebSocket, you know that that's a persistent connection rather than a connectionless uh, connection. So um, this idea of capturing a browser means you're actually establishing a WebSocket connection. So any device that supports WebSockets, which is any modern device these days, can be captured. And that way those connections, those captured connections, are persistent and long-lived and running. And as you push new changes to Karma, Karma pushes those new tests out to the connection devices, runs those tests, and gathers the results. It's a really simple but elegant and efficient way to manage that. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. And of course, if you can capture iOS, and if you can capture smart TVs, and you can capture IE, then all of a sudden we could capture Android, we could capture Windows phones, we could capture um, Firefox phones, and Tizen phones, and all kinds of interesting things. As I said, all that browser needs is WebSocket support. And once it has WebSockets, it can be a captured browser as well. All right. We're doing great. So the next thing we have to play with are the reports. We've been pushing our tests out to various browsers. Now we have to decide, well, what do I want to know about those reports? Out of the box, all Karma gives you is that dot reporter. You've seen those dots showing up on the command line. That's great, but it's the very definition of uh, non-durable, right? You have to be right there staring at the screen for those dots to show up. You probably don't want to do that. And just like we had a list of browsers, and you can have a list of frameworks, you can have a list of reporters as well. And all these are simple comma delimited lists. So one of the reporters you might be interested in is the JUnit reporter. Not that you have any deep abiding love for JUnit, but since the JUnit testing framework is so well understood and established, there are so many different servers out there that if you hand it the JUnit XML reports, it'll turn around and format them, make them pretty and things like that. This ends up being a very common path. Now, we're not going to be installing launchers anymore. We're going to be installing reporters. I'm just going to say, 
all you need to do to know how much you use the internet is not have the internet. And then all of a sudden you get you got a really good idea. You can see this list of reporters goes on for days and days and days. There are so many different reporters out there. So there are some fun ones like a speech reporter. So it will talk to you. You know, uh, rather than just beeping or, or saying you got failing tests, you can have it come back and say, excuse me, Scott, you have failing tests. Yeah. But the JUnit Reporter, the way we would install it is NPM install Karma JUnit Reporter, saving it as a dev dependency, and then we would go into our configuration. In addition to progress, we would have that JUnit Reporter. So if I come into my package JSON, and we definitely have an HTML reporter in place. There we go. We have a JUnit reporter in place as well. So I'm making sure I have that installed. And then I can come into my reporters, and we can see that I've got, in addition to uh, dots, JUnit, and HTML, and coverage as well. So what does that look like? Well, it looks like this. Now, where are my J unit reports? Ah, they're down here hanging out. But yes, this test result right here is my uh, 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 JUnit report file. And notice what's interesting about this. It, out of the box, it defines a number of test suites and a test suite for each browser that we've defined in our Karma JS file. So that's pretty sweet. And then inside of each one of those test suites, it's got a test case for each one of our tests as we go along there. So yeah, being able to add a JUnit set of test results is really powerful. But boy, that's not awful pretty, and it's certainly not anything that you're going to share with your uh, project manager or rest of the team. So I found that these HTML reporters are actually very nice and generate some really good-looking, useful reports. So just like anything else, I'll npm install my Karma HTML reporter. I will add that reporter to my Karma JS comp file. And at this point, you're going to see not only are we going to begin listing out these reporters, but we're going to have a series of uh, configuration blocks in there as well. So as your plugins get a little bit more sophisticated, many times they'll require their own configuration block. And so in this case, you can see I'm configuring those HTML reports to end up in the Karma HTML directory. If we see the Karma HTML directory over there, once again, we have one report per browser. And inside of those browsers, we'll have an index HTML. So if I were to come in right now and I was to open reports, karma, chrome, uh, sure, why not, 42 index, you'll see these are all the unit tests that ran and all of them are clearly passing. So 109 tests ran, zero failed, 23 of them pending. It might be uh, hard to see here, but these yellow tests are your pending ones. The green ones are passing. And if I had any failing tests, those would show up in red. But this HTML is very helpful being able to visualize these reports after the fact. Oh, sorry. Yes, please. I'm sorry, ask me again. The question is, does it show code coverage? Not this report, but stay tuned. I'm going to show you code coverage in just a second. In order to do that, we've got to bring in a code coverage library called Istanbul.
And then once you NPM install Istanbul, you will wire that into Karma, and then it'll give us some code coverage, and I'll show you that code coverage reports. Very, very nice reports. A man after my own report, uh, my, my own heart. I love code coverage reports. So, um, here we're talking about it. Yeah, your question was very timely. Yeah, so being able to install Karma coverage which uses Istanbul under the hood, will install Karma coverage, NPM install Karma coverage, will turn around and configure it, this time asking it what uh, directory it wants to uh, end up in, and uh, what kind of pre-processing you want. Code coverage is kind of interesting because code coverage at the end of the day, if you say we've got 100% code coverage, it means every line of your code has been touched by a unit test. And the only way for these code coverage libraries to know as you go line by line which one's being touched and which one isn't is that it has to turn around and interleave one line of code coverage code for every one line of your production code. If you've done this in the Java world, there are a number of good code coverage libraries out there. I like Kobatura, but there's also uh, uh, J Coverage and uh, Clover and a number of different things. All of the code coverage libraries in the Java world do it by instrumenting your bytecode. So you take your Java code, compile it to class files, and then Kobatur or, or, or Clover or any of those would pull up your bytecode and interleave one line of Kobatur code with one line of your production code. In JavaScript, we can't do that, can we? We don't have bytecode. We only have source code. So what a library like Istanbul does is it opens up your JavaScript source code and injects one line for every line of source code you have in there. Either way, do you want to run instrumented code in production? No. These are test artifacts that you will instrument, run your test suite against, and then throw away the instrumented code, keeping the reports around behind the scenes. So Istanbul is a really nice one in JavaScript land. I gave you some nice ones in Java land as well. But what you end up with is a report that ends up looking like this. And let me actually pull up a live one so we can uh, play around with it a little bit more. So if I open reports now and coverage, there we go. And yeah, I'll open uh, my coverage in Phantom. What we end up with here is something that's going through every one of my modules. And the green ones are the ones that have great coverage. So when we're saying it's got 100%, let me zoom in a little bit so you can see that. When we come in and we say admin has 100% statement coverage, what that means is every line of code has been touched by a unit test, many times more than once. Branches are an important one. Are you testing your ifs but not your else's? Are you testing your tries but not your catches, your switches but not all your cases, things like that? So branch coverage gives you the ability to know if you're doing happy path testing or full path testing. You have functions and lines of code in there as well. But we can see it's got some color coding in there as well. So under admin services, yeah, we've only got about a 60% code coverage, so it's coloring that stuff. This red stuff means, hey, you really need some attention on these things. But isn't this nice? At a glance, I can kind of scroll through and see what I have tested and what I have yet to test. But overall, in our application, uh, uh, this team uh, has uh, about a 40% code coverage, about 11% on our branches, about 20% of our functions. Got a lot of work to do, don't we? Yeah? Absolutely. And while we've been trying to be as good as we can on our unit tests, this is a great example of a team. Great developers, no complaints at all. Got a little bit behind on their testing. They got some, uh, uh, um, uh, some uh, um, legacy um, expenses here that they need to uh, uh, pay down a little bit. But a report like this does a wonderful job of telling you exactly the state of health of the project. 
All right. So to wrap up, we've got a nice testing framework, Karma JS, that we get for free with the Mean JS stack. Um, I'm almost positive that Mean IO ships with this as well. It came out of the Angular project, so it is well respected, well supported, really definitely up to handling the task of all your testing needs. But it is not a testing framework in and of itself. I think what you've seen over and over again is that it's a testing platform that allows you to plug in whatever tests you would like to run. It allows you to plug in whatever reporters you would like to run and run those tests on any platform that you would like to run. Now where I'd like to leave you is one more little bonus project here and that's a project called Protractor. And what Protractor allows you to do is allows you to turn around now and write a series of tests that will be dealing with user acceptance tests. It will require you to have a web server up and running and your application fully written, but then it'll pull up fields, fill in the fields, click on submit buttons, click on links, copy and paste all the things that your users would normally do. You'd be able to do in your uh, protractor test. So let's see here. Um, all right, Grunt. What command do I need to run? There we go, test client. So if I run test client now, actually, you know what? I have one too many instances running. Let me uh, settle things down here for a moment. Let me make sure, yes, that my server is up and running. But Karma JS is going to hang out for a single run. There we go. And now I should be able That wasn't it. Let's see here. There we go. That's what I was looking for right here. These are now protractor tests running. So you can see it going through right now and actively interacting with my web app. Uh, you know, I'm not touching the keyboard at all, right? But it's going through and matching buttons and testing functionality and making sure we can upload these various things. And after it's uploaded the data set, it should be almost done. We're what, doing members, there we go. And once we get down through assignments and everything, we'll start seeing this uh, actively go through and exercise the various screens of our application. So there we go. So now it's going into making sure we can edit a program and pick various things. Now it's logging in and it's making sure that we can go in. There we go. Yep. And search for various people. So when our project manager came up with his MVP, his list is missing.
minimum viable product. He says, all right, you need to be able to log in, and you need to be able to do this, and you need to be able to do that, and you need to be able to do the other. Well, rather than writing all that up in a Word document where we're able to go through and say, yep, it does this, yep, it does this, yep, it does this, what you're seeing is executable documentation going on. This set of test suites is going through and testing all the functionality this team needs in order to go live. And so once all these tests pass, not only do we as developers have a comfort level knowing that all of our server-side tests passed, all of our client-side tests passed, but all of our acceptance tests passed as well on all of the browsers that we are targeting for development. Now, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to let this thing run. We've got about, um, you saw how quickly our unit tests ran, right? Our unit tests ran in well under a minute. Um, these acceptance tests end up running on the order of about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, but we have a really solid testing safety net in place to make sure that we feel comfortable going to production with whatever gets thrown our way. And that, <laughs> oops, there's my unit test uh, uh, focus away from me. That's no good. Yeah. But that, my friends, is testing the mean spec. Despite how angry the internet was with me, did you get a good feel for what we were talking about here? Did you enjoy yourself nonetheless? Thank you, I did as well. Thank you so much for your time and attention.